I am Dr. Mark Catala, and I want to welcome you to the third chapter of Schultz and Schultz's History of Modern Psychology. Today we'll be talking about the physiological influences on psychology. So we'll be talking about things like developments in physiology, uh, research on the nervous system, why this started in Germany, and then a few researchers, Helmholtz, Weber, and Fechner. So let's get started with developments in physiology. Friedrich Bessel was an astronomer, he was a German, and he was interested in errors of measurement. He found that even among the most experienced astronomers, disagreements were common and needed to be taken into account. This suggests the importance of a human observer, what today we would call individual differences. This isn't just important in astronomy, but in every other science too. Also, we can talk about Johannes Mueller. He wanted to make physiology an experimental science, and he actually had a number of famous students too, including Helmholtz and Wundt. He was phenomenally productive. He put out one paper every seven weeks for his professional career. And one of the things he's most famous for is his law of specific nerve energies, where he says that the nature of perception is defined by the pathway over which sensory information is carried. So the origin of the sensation is not important. If you want to see this in action, this law of specific nerve energies, uh, when you're lying in bed tonight with the lights out, rub your eyes and what you'll see is light. That's because light is the type of information that's carried by your eye. Or actually your optic nerve. I think that would be the better way to think about it. What about brain function mapping from the inside? That scowling fellow that you see there is Florenz. And if you were a pigeon, he's probably the last thing that you would see. What he did, he used a process of research called extirpation, where he destroys part of the brain and spinal cord, lets the subject reheal, and then observes the consequences. And he found that the cerebrum controls higher mental processes, that uh, I should mention too, this is all research with pigeons, that parts of the midbrain control visual and auditory reflexes, and the cerebellum controls coordination. Finally, the medulla controls things like heartbeat, respiration, and other vital functions. Another French researcher was Paul Broca, and he is illustrative of the clinical method. Uh, he, had, he was sent patients who had difficulty speaking, uh, it's, all, it's been called Broca's aphasia. It's now known as a expressive aphasia. It's when, but it's odd because the patients have difficulty speaking, but they can sing. And by far the best question I've ever been asked as a professor, I had a student ask me one time, could somebody with Broca's aphasia rap? And it gets to the heart of this question, is rapping singing or is it rhythmic talking? Uh, and the answer is, I didn't know the answer for years, but actually there is a rapper who has Broca's aphasia. So the answer to that question is yes. To come back to Broca though, autopsies revealed lesions in the third frontal convolution of the left hemisphere of the cerebral cortex. And that's basically what the clinical method is. People who had that had Broca's aphasia or expressive aphasia. So the clinical method is when you do posthumous examinations of the brain to find damage that impacted the person in life. Finally, Gustav Frisch and uh, Eduard Hitzig are good examples of using electrical stimulation. They did research where they stimulated the cortical areas of dogs and rabbits and found that they could induce movement in their front and back legs. What about brain function from the outside? Well, here we can talk about Franz Gall, who invented phrenology or cranioscopy. He thought that the shape of a person's skull revealed intellectual and emotional characteristics about them. So there were 14 faculties for uh, intellect and 21 faculties for uh, emotion. Now the pattern of bumps and dents determined your personality. He tried to be a scientist about this. He would go to prisons and study thieves to find if they had a bump over their left ear, which is area eight if you're checking your phrenological skull. 
The propensity that he was checking for was what he called acquisitiveness. The problem is that his colleagues saw him as a quack and a fraud for doing this type of research. His students, like Johann Spurzheim, were far worse, and they used phrenology to make money reading people's skulls. And so you would go, and this was essentially like a personality test. And you may have heard the expression, you need to have your head examined. Well, this was big business for decades. As late as 1929, the psychograph company was creating a machine that would be lowered onto a person's head and would read the bumps and dents on their head. Phrenology is a good example of just because something's popular, it doesn't mean that it's true. And that's a good lesson to learn, uh, and not just in psychology. So here's some shocking research. Luigi Galvani suggested that nerve impulses are electrical. And he demonstrated this by hanging frogs from metal hooks off his balcony of his house. During a thunderstorm, uh, they would twitch and kick. And he literally killed thousands of frogs uh, just to watch them twitch after their death. Galvani's nephew, Giovanni Aldini, mixed research with showmanship. He reanimated sever severed heads of criminals. I'll give you a little background on this because your book doesn't. Uh, there was a guy in London named George Forrester and he drowned his wife and kids and then he was hung in 1803. And what Aldini did was he cut the head off uh, hooked up uh, electrical impulses to it and made the face twitch and made it seem like it came alive. So you can see how Mary Shelley was influenced by these demonstrations when she was writing Frankenstein or Frankenstein, if, you're, uh, if you've seen the Mel Brooks uh, movie Young Frankenstein. But uh, you could also consider him in some ways as a pioneer in uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Alessandro Volta invented the first electric battery, and it was known as a voltanic pile, and gave scientists the ability to produce electricity in the lab. And then finally, talking about shocking research, Santiago uh, Callao discovered the direction of travel of nerve impulses in the brain and spinal cord, for which he won the Nobel Prize in 1906. So why do we talk about Germany as being where experimental psychology and psychophysics begins and not somewhere else? Well, there's a few uh, answers to this. One is the German approach to science and this idea of experimental physiology. The Ber Berlin Physical Society was formed in the 1840s and it was students of Mueller. And what they hoped to do, they vowed to do, they made an oath about it, was to connect physiology with physics. Uh, so they swore an oath where they signed their names in blood that this is what they were going to research. Uh, I did not have to sign my name in blood when I got my PhD. Uh, I didn't even have to do it in my, when I joined my fraternity. A few of the reasons why Germany is uh, where the science develops is because they defined science broadly. And so in England and France, science was considered just physics and chemistry, where the Germans saw science as things like linguistics, history, archaeology, aesthetics, logic, and even literary criticism. Another factor is that German universities were devoted to the principle of academic freedom. So professors could lecture and do research on whatever interested them. A third factor is that Germany has a large number of universities at this time. England only had two. And America had, until Johns Hopkins opened, that was really the first American research university that was based on a German model, where graduate students would be trained in research. So practically speaking, uh, you could make a comfortable living as a research scientist in Germany, but not in France, England, or the United States. So that's why Germany is where this develops. Let's talk about Hermann von Helmholtz. Now he emphasizes a mechanistic and deterministic approach and he assumed that the human sense organs functioned like machines. He's really considered to be one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century. He's not a psychologist. That was one of only one of his interests. His uh, areas of 
uh, real impact were in things like physics, medicine, uh, physiology. Uh, I put hay fever up there because your book talks about it. But he, write, he writes on a number of diverse subjects like after images, color blindness, the formation of glaciers, uh, geometric axioms. So he makes big contributions to, psych to psychology too, at least three. The first is that he investigates the speed of a neural impulse. Now this was part of some other research he was doing, but he worked with frog nerves of different lengths and then recorded the time uh, delay between the stimulation of the nerve and a muscular response. Now people at the time thought that it might be instantaneous, but he finds that 90 feet per second is the conduction speed of nerves. His second contribution is the young Helmholtz theory of color vision. This is what we would now call the trichromatic theory. It's the theory that there's three different types of receptors that are responsible for the perception of color vision, uh, essentially green, blue, uh, and red cones in the eye, although uh, he didn't propose that. His third contribution is his research on audition, the perception of tones, the nature of harmony and discord, and the problem of resonance. Although he wasn't a psychologist, I think you can see he contributes a lot to the study of how human senses work. Let's talk about Ernst Weber. He actually taught at Leipzig from 1817 to 1871, and his research mostly focused on muscular and skin senses. Uh, and he teaches anatomy and physiology there. I guess I should mention that. For example, he does research on what's called a two-point threshold, the point at which two separate sources of stimulation can be distinguished. You can try uh, this at home with your roommate or significant other, and that might be the same person. But what you need to do is bend a paper clip so it has two points out, and then have your roommate close their eyes, and then you touch their palm with the paper clip, and you can see how far, a point, how far apart the points need to be for them to report feeling two points rather than one point. Also, uh, there are different places on your skin that are differentially sensitive to this two point threshold. So when do you feel two points? When do you feel one point? I'll let you explore that on your own with your significant other or roommate. But this is the first experimental demonstration of the concept of a threshold. And so that's why it's important. Weber's other real contribution is this idea of just noticeable differences, or JND. This is the smallest difference between weights that could be detected. He finds that it's a constant ratio. So this idea of a 1 to 40 uh, ratio is that people can differentiate between weights of 40 and 41 grams or weights of 80 and 82 grams. So it's a constant ratio. He also found that subjects could detect smaller differences when weights were lifted than when they were placed in their hands. And he concluded that the internal muscular sensations of lifting the weights must have had an effect also on their ability to discriminate between the weights. We're going to finish by discussing Gustav Fechner. Uh, he came to Weber's lectures in, at the University of Leipzig in 1817, and then he never left. He just spent the rest of his career there, too. Now, he was made a full professor in 1833, but he fell into a multi-year depression. He was very sensitive to light due to some research on afterimages that he was doing where he had stared at the sun with colored lenses, so he spent much of his time in a darkened room with his mother reading to him. He was eventually cured of his depression by eating wine-soaked ham, and he lived to be 86 years old. Now, a very important date in the history of psychology is considered to be October 22nd, 1850. And this is when Fechner has an insight on the mind-body relationship. And he proposes that it's a quantitative relationship between a mental sensation and a material stimulus so that the increase in the intensity of a stimulus does not produce a one-to-one -one increase in the intensity of the resulting sensation. So for example, adding one bell to an already ringing bell produces a greater increase in sensation than adding one bell to 10 ringing bells. And so that's a good way to think about it. 
he realizes that the amount of sensation, which is the mental quality, depends on the amount of stimulation, the physical quality. So to measure, measure the change in sensation, you have to measure the change in stimulation. So this allows you to formulate a quantitative relationship between the mental and material worlds. Fechner proposes two ways to measure sensations. First, we can determine whether a stimulus is present or absent, whether it is sensed or not sensed. And that's what the absolute threshold is, the point of intensity below which you don't experience any sensation. And above that point, you experience a sensation. Now, this is a valuable but limited idea because only one value of the sensation, the lowest level, can be determined. So he came up with this idea of a differential threshold. And this is the least amount of change in a stimulus that gives rise to a change in sensation. If this sounds familiar, that's because it is. It's essentially Ernst Weber's work, who was his colleague at Leipzig. But we'll revisit that in a moment. The idea of psychophysics is this. For each sense, there's a relative increase in stimulus intensity that produces an observable change in the intensity of the stimulation. So both the sensation, which is the mind or mental quality, as well as the stimulus, which is the body or material quality, can be measured. And this can be reflected in that equation. S is equal to K log R, where S is the magnitude of the sensation, K is a constant, and R is the magnitude of the stimulus. Now you can see that this relationship is logarithmic with one, um, with, as one series increases arithmetically, the other is geometrically. And this is essentially what Weber's work had shown, although Fechner said he wasn't familiar with Weber's work until after he had started his own work. Uh-huh. The methods of psychophysics. Uh, this is, I guess, more what psychophysics is, the relationship between the mental and the material, if you want to think about that. So three different ideas, the method of average error or method of adjustment. So subjects adjust a variable stimulus until they perceive it to be equal to a constant stimulus. And over a number of trials, the average value of the differences represent the error of observation. So that can be determined. The method of constant stimuli is that you measure stimuluses, uh, stimulus uh, difference required to produce a given proportion of correct judgments. So it's easier to understand through an example. You have a person lift 100 grams and then a number of other weights like 88 or 92 or 108 grams and they're asked if the second weight is heavier, lighter, or equal to the first weight. Finally, the method of limits, which is that JNDs, just noticeable differences, are averaged to determine the difference threshold. Uh, so this is what we were talking about in the previous slide. Fechner does his psychophysics research uh, program for seven years and then publishes his book, Elements of Psychophysics, in 1860. Now, at the time, some people considered this finding or this book to be as important as the discovery of the laws of gravity. I don't think it's considered that today. This was the first publication to show that psychological phenomena could be studied experimentally and quantitatively. And it was largely due to Fechner's work that Wundt conceived his plan for an experimental psychology. Now, as an epilogue on Fechner, I think it should be said that, that he left his papers to Wundt and Wundt gave the eulogy at Fechner's funeral. So that's chapter three, and thanks for listening.